Hi there, my name's Josh Muller. I'm the president of the Melbourne Sexual Network and I go by they, them pronouns and I'm looking forward to talking about Bio Health Month. Hello, I'm Meg. Yeah, so I use um, they and she pronouns and lovely to see you all. I'm also a member of MBN. Today we're going to talk all about Bio Health and Bi Plus Health. So, so really talking about anyone who's multigender attracted uh, with however you might identify, whether that's bisexual, pansexual, poly, or uh, omnisexual, or queer, or using even a different word. But really we're talking about health outcomes because our health is important. Massively, and I think uh, it's, it's something that a lot of people don't always understand about our community, that we do have quite a lot of extra health concerns and sort of vulnerabilities to certain things, particularly mental health conditions, and, and, and we're at more at risk of homelessness and violence than a lot of communities are as well. And I think it's really important we talk about it, particularly this month, and sort of raise awareness and also, like you said, talk about ways of moving forward and improving things for, for our amazing, broad, beautiful community. Right, so that, that's actually what Melbourne Bisexual Network is all about, is reducing biphobia, improving health outcomes for bi plus people. But I wanted to start off with maybe a couple of stats from the Private Lives Study, which is a recent study by Archers at La Trobe University. They did a massive study of LGBTQ plus people all across Australia. That's the Private Lives one is of adults. And firstly, having a look at homelessness, the experience of whether someone ever has experienced homelessness, 22% of bisexuals, 34% of pansexuals, and 33% of queer people had ever experienced homelessness, which are alarmingly high figures. And I guess I also was looking at um, experiences of psychological distress, so that's measured with the K10, the Kessler 10 um, inventory, and for, you know, comparison's sake, the general population experiencing high or very high psychological distress, it's about 13%, um, so maybe like one in eight. For bisexual people, is 68%, two in three. For pansexual people, 76%. Queer people, 68%. And lesbians were about 50%, gay people 44%. So ju just really staggering statistics in terms of rates of psychological distress, both, yeah, so some of the kind of outcomes of distress, but also, yeah, at least one of these possible causes around, around homelessness and... We actually see similar figures in domestic violence, in rates of receiving discrimination. They're really hard statistics to hear, aren't they? I think even when you know that it's the case, I still struggle every time they come up because you just think it's, yeah, they're so high. And it's, again, I feel like so often as well, like we kind of are, within community, we're aware that, you know, queer people suffer more with our mental health. And... I think sometimes it's hard when you talk to folks outside community who kind of like, why are you talking about the fact that you're queer? Or why is this relevant? Why do you, I don't know, push it in my face or rave about it all the time? I'm like, because it really impacts our lives in these huge, vast ways. And again, within community, I often feel that we talk to, to usually like cisgender, gay or lesbian folks, and they're really surprised by how much worse things are for bi plus communities. And, um, yeah, I think still that we, we've been known about these statistics for years and I still think it's taking a lot of time for it to kind of filter into the, into the conversation outside of our own communities and even, even within our communities. I think a lot of people are still really surprised when they find it out. I know I was at the beginning. You know your own personal experiences and also seeing on paper the number of other people with this in common with you that are struggling. And I think that's part of it. Sometimes my question is how do we expand that more so people really listen and really understand like how high these statistics are and really think about what we can be doing to support our communities. Reading through these statistics, actually, I, you know, I've been in pretty queer circles for a while now and I, I work in the area as a, as a psychologist. The statistic that sort of shocked me the most was that the general population 
only 13% experienced high or very high psychological distress. Actually, that's <laughs> right, re- remar- remarkably low. Um, and and I, I guess I sometimes forget that, that actually in terms of the mainstream and the average person and the vast majority of the population in Australia at least, but, but in many, many other places as well, the really high psychological distress. And by, by that, we mean that things like depression and anxiety, maybe panic, maybe um, thoughts of hopelessness or helplessness. The really high rates of that that are in queer community are so normalized and I find, it, find that we talk about it so much in community that it's sort of a shock to remember. Actually, most of the population don't experience life like that. I think it can be quite staggering. Um, and again, having, having like a cisgender heterosexual partner and how differently they experience the world. Um, yeah, you forget that. I think, like you say, in community, we tend to talk a lot more about our mental health, which I do think is a wonderful thing. And I, I'm really grateful for that. And I also think, yeah, like you say, it normalizes our like lower levels of okayness <laughs> to possibly sometimes make us take it less seriously in the broader spectrum of yeah, who, who isn't struggling in the same way. Um, I do think it's really important that, like you say, that that part was again quite shocking to me. I'm like only 13% of people are finding life life this hard um, in the general general like a cisgender heterosexual population. Um, I do wonder about how these things have shifted with with the pandemic, and I think it's really highlighted how people experience that like, difficulty and those kind of ongoing ongoing problems that aren't just something that you know pops up for a week and then goes away I think um, the pandemic has made a lot of people aware of that in a way that they never had been before so I think um, it'd be really interesting to see say a year from now what these kind of statistics are looking like for everybody um, and I, I again I hope that that greater awareness will improve our kind of way of caring for people who are struggling in these ways because yeah we, we need more don't we it's, it's it's very evident from these numbers that the kind of there isn't the support to su- just to help people through life and how challenging it can all be. Something that I was really reflecting on was that these statistics are not that new. So it's it's been a long while that governments uh, and you know Australian government, Victorian government, for where we're based have known that these stats are real bad. The stats are a reflection of what's actually happening in the community and what's actually happening in the population. And yet we don't see an increase really proportionally for funding. We don't really see an increase in attention or prioritisation in terms of like, what the health minister tends to be talking about, they're not talking about these issues. In fact, I I don't know that I've ever seen a press conference from like the federal health minister talking about bypass health. If we had, you know, if we imagined a scenario where category X of people experienced really like seven or eight times as worse mental health as another category of people, surely that would be shocking enough to say, well, we need to pay attention to that. Like, let's get our best best people on that right now. And it's not like bisexual people are just a tiny amount of the population either. Um, There's a recent Gallup poll in America, and we tend to find uh, population uh, sort of epidemiology as well as population health things similar-ish to America in many ways. The 2020 Gallup poll that said out of Generation Z, there's maybe 11.5% of Gen Z who identified as bisexual or multigender attracted. Um, 5% of millennials, 2% of uh, Gen X, 0.3% of um, baby boomers. But to to see to see that like increase through the generations for bisexuality and identifying as bisexual 
compare that with how many people identified as gay or lesbian, which has essentially stayed fairly, fairly stable across the last three generations at about one to two percent of the population. Seeing people identifying as bisexual, like bumping up and up and up. If that pattern continues into the (laughs) generation, we think ahead to whatever the generation is after Gen Z, like when will it stabilise? Will it stabilise at 20% or 50%? Even if it just stabilises at 11%, that's two and a half million Australians for, for a comparison of the population. If we're saying maybe something like two and a half million Australians, whether they publicly identify as bisexual or it's rather an internal experience that they don't feel able to share. And their experience, you know, 76 or 68% of them are experiencing high or very high psychological distress. Wow. Like that's, that's horrible. One in 10 people potentially are bisexual. And like you say, then with those stats on top, it's again, like I use the word again, staggering. It is staggering. As, as I said, see on a great meme this week that the buys are rising. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how many of us there are again. And I think it's interesting to talk about why more people are talking about themselves as being bisexual or pansexual, or polysexual, or multi-gender attracted. Because I think that it really speaks to the depths of shame we a lot of us have felt and how hard it has been to come out and be ourselves more openly. And I think it's also, on a more positive note, it's great that more people are feeling able to, to like claim those things for themselves and to not be too stuck in shame to come out and say, this is, this is what I am and this is how I experience the world. As much as um, celebrities, you know, coming out as bisexual or pop stars coming out as bisexual does not equal improved health outcomes for the majority of us, especially the most vulnerable in our community, it is important because of that role modelling. That's super important. And I think my plus people are very much at the level still of just getting awareness which seems like such a, such a basic thing, like it is a basic thing, but we don't have it yet. And it's why, again, we still hear this, com- this conversation about bi visibility and bi invisibility so often. And I think kind of sometimes within community and within um, particularly sub-communities like ours where we've been working on these things for a number of years, I know I, I myself can feel a little bit frustrated by that concept, I think. But I'm here, I've been here, and there's lots of us have been here. But again, I think it's important to, to recognize that we do still experience a lot of invisibility, and the fact that people are claiming those things is important because I do think it's part of the journey towards improvement, isn't it? And if you can't identify a problem, you can't solve the problem. So at least I try to be hopeful about that, that at least we're still in the stages of identifying problems and putting them forward, and hopefully, as they gain in size they'll also gain traction hopefully it will be taken more seriously hopefully we will see bi plus health plans and hear the word bisexual and pansexual in in formal meetings and not just people being like because i still think again there's so much stigma around the word i know sometimes you say it and you can feel you can feel the looks people give you or the kind of discomfort it brings up in people and hopefully the more we're doing that the less those things will happen and the more we can start to think about what it means to be bisexual and how it's impacting us and what we can do to improve those things rather than just waving our bi flags and not necessarily yeah feeling like that's offering us much in terms of progress beyond being seen because being seen is part of it and being supported and believed and encouraged and have money spent on us is, is also very important part of that too like the celebration part of pride is super du- duper important especially for for keeping our hopes up so that we don't sink into complete hopelessness as activists because it can be really demoralizing doing this work year on year and seeing not much progress or a change in many respects but like <laughs> yeah what 
what is the bare minimum? I, I, I saw the other day Oreo on their Twitter account just tweeted, trans people exist. Yes, we're, we're here. But, God, it, in terms of, like, missing the point of what is in any way effective in raising up the lives or the health or the joy of queer people, just saying that we exist or that we're valid, I'm, I'm kind of sick of it, to be honest. Because we end up getting getting into these like online arguments or or like getting caught up in discussions about are we valid or not or do we exist or not. I'm like, let's just take that as a given. I'm not interested in putting energy into an an argument where the starting anchor is existence. No rubbish let's let's jump ahead to like we exist we've like been part of major studies that are government funded that are run by you know like world's best universities and here are all of the stats like we're way past just do we exist or not although universities are still running studies on like general response to say are there any true bisexuals or does bisexual does bisexuality really exist by measuring erectile response to bi plus men watching different types of porn? I'm like, oh my God, what a waste of time and money. It's so wild, isn't it? And again, how many of us get stuck in that place? Like, it sounds absurd probably from the outside, but that place of do I really exist as I am? Is this real? Mm. The number of bi folk who are like, am I secretly gay? Or am I really like a confused heterosexual person? And mm. it is exhausting and the amount of energy and and like, yeah, big cause of emotional distress is, is questioning your own version of who you are, which I think is important as a human being, but like, to, not just because you're bisexual, and this idea of always being confused, it's exhausting and it really impacts individuals, like, hugely. And this constant questioning of our existence, um, but for bi folk and trans folk, it's like, we we do, we have, we have always been here. We've been existing for all of time. The, like, maybe language has changed, maybe visibility has changed, but th this is nothing new. And like you said, the fact that we're still talking about the fact that we exist, it's like, no shit. We're definitely here. We've been here. I listed off those Gallup poll stats earlier on to say, yeah, maybe like 0.3% of baby boomers identify as bisexual in, in the United States at least. That number is so low partially because so many people who, you know, if they were, if they were born in 10 years ago or 15 years ago, maybe they would be part of that Gen Z group who are identifying as bisexual. The other piece of it, though, is that people who live in high or very high amounts of psychological distress, that's an outcome measure that also captures things like suicide, violence, poor physical health outcomes. We know that people with really serious mental health experiences, be it through abuse or trauma, or maybe it's ended up in some kind of drug addiction in order to cope, like drug or alcohol or smoking, that all of these things actually lower our life expectancy. And so maybe some of the bi elders who we would have who, you know, are getting into their 60s or 70s now, maybe they didn't make it. And I think this for bi and trans, which I think, um, again, I always, this should, should always come up with bi conversations, is that a huge number of bi folks are trans and a huge number of trans folks are bi. And, yeah, like, there's so many of us didn't didn't make it, and so we don't have as many people to look to and I think particularly around things like um, HIV as well, which I think often, I think some of our stigma sort of stems from that period too, of being the people that were kind of between and seen as 
like causing more problems. And I think that that still speaks to a lot of people's shame now. And you look at that still with sexual health today for, for bi folks, how hard it can be to access the right kind of sexual health if we're not able to be honest about who we are and what, are, what we're doing. And I think, again, that's, you see that particularly with saying most, a lot of men who are sleeping with men in Melbourne are able to access things like PrEP because, and it's incredible, it absolutely changes, it's changed the community in so many amazing ways. And I'm worried that a lot of bi, bi men aren't because maybe that's just not something they feel able or comfortable to talk about. But again, there's, there's risk factors for in so many directions which sort of stem back all these ways to to our lack of comfort and visibility and ability to own who we are because of all these different problems and that it just exacerbates everything. So there's a lot of sadness about what kind of problems we're still experiencing as a community, which, yeah, we could we could not be experiencing in the same way if, if things had shifted more and if we felt like it was more okay to be ourselves and there was, there was a bit more awareness and there was more support in helping us step out of our shame. We often, you know, you, you hear the phrase something around of like a generation of gay men passed away during AIDS. That is absolutely true, but a lot of them were bi. And re- rarely do we hear that acknowledged, whether they were by identifying, like using that word as a label or in practice around who they are attracted to and, and who they had sex with or who they had relationships with. And like now, when, it, when we talk about um, HIV and, and uh, sort of looking after men's sexual health particularly, um, not to say anything about women's sexual health as well or non-binary people, whatever, but we use the word, the, the phrase, MSM, like men who have sex with men, because it it talks about the behaviour where many of them, many of the men who have sex with men identify as straight. And so much of that has got to do with biphobic stigma and internalised biphobia that they don't feel able to use the word bisexual, even though maybe in practice... They're having sex with men. They have a wife who make, you know, like not all men, in fact, maybe actually only a minority of men who are in relationships with women who have like, you know, a wife and a family and things, but are also having sex with men. Like we have that kind of Hollywood story of the closeted gay man who is in this unhappy marriage and doing it for appearances but actually there are heaps who are bi or, or like multi-gender attracted who are attracted to their wife and do maybe have a good relationship with them in some ways, but are also attracted to men and because it's so shame-ridden, they, they keep it hidden. And that, like, that hiding and that shame around what it means to be a man and how dragged through the mud this idea of the bisexual man has been over, you know, over the previous generations. That is absolutely part of what's driving these really poor health outcomes. And it's, yeah, a real tragedy. That erasure of anything that isn't a simple, a simple binary experience, which we see in sexuality and in gender, that you're yeah, a confused gay man who is married to a woman that, that, that you don't really love, which is so dismissive of so many experiences which aren't that. And this again, the same like this idea of um, transness is a, a binary switch from one thing to another, which again, dismissive of most people's experiences. And so many, particularly folks in our, our community that just don't identify with those binary ideas. and. Yeah, there's so much is lost in that, isn't it? I think that there's been really great content about AIDS and HIV around recently, but I still feel so often there is no mention of bisexuality. <laughs> Again, it's it's always been there. It's always it's always been a part of these stories, but it's so rarely ever mentioned. And again, that there's a lot of a lot of sadness in that because these are these are our stories too, and these impacted our community in all these huge ways. 
And I, and I yeah, definitely think that speaks to the ongoing shame and stigma that we are still not being acknowledged, we're still not being talked about. And that really does do harm. It's not just about, you know, being annoyed that you're not in the story, but it's that it's actively harming us by not by it not being talked about. I, I'm conscious that we've been talking about a lot of the health problems, um, Meg, and uh, not, not really too much about, well, what, what can we do about it? And there absolutely are things that we can do as community members and also as allies to support BIPLAS health. Some of it is learning and also dispelling myths, um, which, you know, you and I have ta- talked about on a few episodes before, but... In my opinion, one of the most powerful things that you can do as a multi-gender attracted person in terms of improving your own health outcomes is actually connecting to BIPLUS community and speaking with other bi people or pansexual people to say, here I am and I belong and I am queer enough. That then can form such a powerful um, space to get education, get resources, get connected to a community of supportive people who are going to say, yes, you're welcome, you belong here. And I I think that's something that in MPN we didn't initially think we would be doing too much community building work as part of improving BIPLUS health outcomes, but well, we've really shifted our priorities to say, actually, yeah, that is a main priority for us. And one of the main ways in which we can help directly improve health outcomes for BIPLUS people. It's life-changing. And I think it's something that I know when I first found MBN, it was coming into that space and just being like, this this is incredible. Just being surrounded by people who have an, uh, an understanding of this part of my experience and how much that that just increases things in your life and like buoys you through harder periods and people that you can express those frustrations to and also talk about all the great parts of being multi-gender attracted. And uh, yeah, it's, I say that to everybody who is on their journey of navigating their sexuality is find, seek out things where you feel seen, seek out, seek out these communities because they do exist and they're, they're big and they're growing and they're wonderful. Um, there's so much there to be found. And even if you want to do it very passively, we were talking about this yesterday, this idea of a passive involvement in community, I think is a really important thing for a lot of bisexual folk, particularly at the beginning and maybe forever, depending on what their experiences are, what their life is, safety, so many factors. And that there's a lot of stuff you can passively enjoy and see yourself in. And like it's, it's why I love things like Instagram and Facebook groups because there's this way that you can exist in a space without having to physically exist in a space if that's not something you feel able or ready or comfortable to do. And it it really does shift so much. And I see that I run a small Instagram and just the people who reach out and say, oh, I just feel seen. Like I see myself here and it feels really good. Like there's other people like me, there's people who share some of these experiences and it feels really affirming and validating. I definitely encourage anybody questioning or just, I don't know, navigating these parts of themselves to try and seek some of these things out to affirm. I think my other bit, bit of advice for whether it's following people or reading books or joining groups or things like that is you don't necessarily have to find people who are exactly like you or who have the exact same experiences as you. Um, I've, I've spoken to, I don't know, bi, bi guys who are into footy and they're manual labourers and they, ha- you know, don't know anything about gender theory and they've felt felt quite uncertain about participating in super-duper queer groups where everyone's got coloured hair and nose piercings and are talking about Judith Butler. And, like, yeah, like, just because this guy and this group both identify as bisexual doesn't mean that they're going to share lots of different characteristics. But, like, that's okay. I've certainly learned that some of my most kind of powerful lessons or had parts of um, 
kinship and self-identification with gay people who are not multi-gender attracted, but share some similar experiences and, and sort of opening myself up to, to learning about that has been crucial. And so that, I think that that's the real strength of being part of LGBTQIA plus community. We have so much to learn from other parts of the rainbow and can feel kinship and belonging as part of that greater collection of diverse voices, which I think is really beautiful and important, um, not to kind of silo ourselves off too much. Those shared threads of experience are really wonderful and so lovely to get to just explore with people and and I have the same with lots of my cisgender heterosexual friends as well and I, I don't like this idea that somehow there's like an us and them mentality in any of those ways. I think it's, it's not helpful, it's not useful because I think all of us experience the world in so many nuanced ways that you can find something often in common with the most unlikely people. And often you can meet people who have loads in common with you and really not necessarily connect to. But I love being part of the LGBTIQ+. Plus. I love that we're always adding letters and I, I love that it's expansive and broad and that's mm. the best thing about it, isn't it? Is that like we share parts, we share aspects of our identity with folks and and we have all this other stuff to explore and discuss and learn about from one another. And that's definitely been the best part of finding a community for me is how much it's expanded everything about how I think and look and see. And yeah, I think it's really important to, to highlight that, that need for like, connection rather than separation. Connection rather than separation. I think that's actually a really beautiful note to end on, Meg. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. Um, thanks to those who've listened along or watched along. I feel really grateful that I've gotten to talk to you about Bi Plus Health Month, Bi Health Issues in general today. And so always good to chat. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a really lovely, lovely chat about some tough stuff and also some really beautiful things. And um, just if people do want to try and seek us out in any way, there's a small Instagram called Big Bi Bonanza, where I post a lot of very silly content about being bi. But it's just, again, like a nice place to connect and, and see shared experiences. And, and the Melbourne Bisexual Network is a great source of all sorts of wonderful things. And we're always working on expanding the different ways that people can connect in with us as well. Well, thanks for tuning in. I hope you have a good day. Happy Bi Health Month. Bye.